Thanks, Cara. Okay, we're going to spend some time thinking about that passage together. It's our second last week in 1 Peter, uh, and we get another decent challenge and encouragement from the Apostle Peter tonight. Let's uh, pray and ask for God's help. Our Father, we thank you for these moments that we have together with your word in front of us and ask that you'd be with us by your spirit. Father, please, today, by your word and spirit, give us strength for today and hope for tomorrow. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Uh, well, with a teacher as a wife and five school-age kids, I feel like there's been a lot of talk and action in our home to do with end-of-year awards giving and prize giving and speech days and certificates and reports. And so there's been lots thrown around about the kind of words that describe what school achievement is all about, outstanding achievement, and excellence in all areas, and consistent effort, and most improved, and uh, throwing around all those ideas and realities this week got me thinking about how we value certain things, and what we think glory looks like in this world, and how from very early on at, you know, five years old, we're being told that glory in this world is through achievement, it's through what you can show of yourself. It's at least through competence or effort or some kind of contribution. And so the accolades of the world have to do with your achievement. And we have this addiction in our culture that is the achievement addiction. Justine Toe from our morning congregation has written this really helpful little book called that, Achievement Addiction. Very stimulating, thought-provoking little read. Good conversation starter, I commend it to you. But the Apostle Peter, like most of the Bible and like Jesus does time and time again, kind of turns that thinking on its head. The glory, the accolades of this world that have to do with our achievement, our competence, our effort, our contribution is nowhere to be found in the letter of 1 Peter, but instead, time and time again, what is glory attached to? And the glory not of this world, but the glory of the creator of this world, what is that attached to? So often, it's attached to suffering. Glory comes not through achievement, not through effort or contribution, glory comes through suffering, which makes perfect sense when you think about the Lord Jesus, whose glory came through the cross where he suffered and died for the sins of the world. And so, trusting in a crucified Messiah, Peter has been telling us week on week, will mean you'll face suffering of all kinds in this life. And once again, that kind of suffering is on display at the end of chapter 4. And so here is what he wants to say, that when suffering for being a Christian comes, don't be surprised but rejoice, don't be ashamed but praise God, committing yourself to your faithful Creator and continuing to do good. That's our sermon today, when suffering comes, don't be surprised but rejoice, don't be ashamed but praise and commit yourself to your faithful Creator and continue to do good. Suffering exists in the Christian life to remind you that your identity is not found in awards or achievement, but it's found in standing firm in the true, unmerited grace of God. That your hope and your security isn't found in your circumstances, but in your Saviour. And so when suffering for being a Christian comes, don't be surprised, but rejoice. That's the first thing he says. Have a look at verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, 
but rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the suffering of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Don't be surprised, he says, when the fiery ordeal comes upon you, which might be a bit of a play on words because at the time Christians were being blamed for a big fire that they didn't start, right? So Christians were being scapegoated uh, for public and very uh, damaging realities, fiery ordeals. Uh, And Peter puts his finger on something that you and I maybe have experienced, that when suffering for being a Christian comes, you start to think, what gives? Isn't the Christian life meant to be one where we experience joy and peace and blessing? Why does it feel like I'm receiving the opposite of blessing? Surely suffering is the opposite of blessing. Surely suffering is the absence of of blessing and therefore the absence of God's love and his care. When I suffer, I'm tempted to feel and to to think and to believe that I'm all alone, that I've been abandoned by God and I'm not the recipient of his blessings and so therefore maybe I should just give it all away. Once again, that's turned on its head As Peter says, no, suffering for being a Christian isn't the absence of blessing, that's where blessing lives. That's where God does His work. Something strange is not happening to you, something very normal, something to be expected, something that's very consistent, not only with the life of Jesus, but the life of all who would follow Him. It's not the path of comfy, cosy Christianity, Following a crucified Messiah is the path of suffering. And so you should rejoice in suffering because it shows that you've connected yourself to the suffering servant, the crucified Messiah, and that you're participating in his sufferings, not in the sense that you're earning your salvation or contributing to what Jesus has done, but you're in line with and connected to his suffering on the cross for the sins of the world. And so if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, that is the very place of blessing. It's where the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. It's where the spirit is close and at work, shaping you to be more like Jesus, tearing your identity and your status and your achievements away from you so that you cling to the Saviour and to Him alone. It's remarkable that we hear these words from the Apostle Peter because you remember he didn't like the idea that suffering had anything to do with the Christian life or with Jesus. Do you remember that? When Jesus said, okay, I'm going to Jerusalem to die on the cross for the sins of the world, Peter said, whoa, 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 whoa. That can't be. You are the exalted king. You're the saviour. You're the the Lord. Jesus says, exactly. And in God's economy of salvation, it's the suffering servant who is Lord of the universe, who suffers and dies in shame on a cross outside Jerusalem. It doesn't look impressive, it looks weak, it looks pitiful and yet it is the wisdom and the power of God for our redemption and it is the only hope for all the world. It's interesting, even as we suffer, we can turn suffering into some kind of achievement thing as well thinking that suffering somehow does add to our achievement as a Christian, our identity, our status, because I've suffered greatly. Helen Rosevear was a missionary in the Congo back in the 60s, I think, and she suffered unimaginable pain and trauma, not least of which being imprisoned and held hostage for six months. 
and tortured and raped. And yet even through her suffering, as she persevered and trusted Jesus, later in life she looked back and thought, I've somehow turned that into this achievement thing where I want Jesus, but I want respect too. I want my respect and I want to be popular and I want people to have good opinion of me and I want want people to see me as successful. I want to go out with trumpets blaring from a fair, farewell do that I organise myself with photographs and recordings to show and to play at home, to show that I, I have achieved something. I want to feel needed. I want to feel respected. I want to feel like even the other missionaries worry about me and can't keep doing all the things that I did. I want this and that and the other. I want more and more. I want Jesus plus Jesus, plus. And as she came to the end of her life, she said, no. Jesus says, you can't have that. It's Jesus only. She writes, it's not Jesus plus Helen. It's just Jesus. And so often it's through the course of suffering that Jesus, by the Spirit of glory, teaches us that lesson, which is painful, but necessary and saving. And this echoes the very words of Jesus himself, who said, blessed are you, when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. And so connected to that, people insulting you, falsely saying all kinds of evil against you, losing your reputation, losing your status, being disadvantaged for being a Christian, blessed are you. And when that happens, not only rejoice and don't be surprised, but praise God and don't be ashamed. That's the second thing. Have a look at verse 15. If you suffer then, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed but praise God that you bear that name. Peter's point about being ashamed is that you shouldn't feel shame for suffering simply for being a Christian, being ostracised and um, alienated for claiming the name of Jesus. That is a name that you should cling to as as a badge of honour and identity and strength and peace in the midst of suffering. But he says, make sure that when you do suffer, It's not because you're a murderer or a thief. If you suffer because you're a murderer, if you are sent to prison for murdering someone, that's not unjust suffering. You deserve to be in prison. If you get in trouble for stealing, well, you're not getting in trouble for being a Christian, you're being in trouble for being a thief. Here's the one that might bite a little bit. If you get persecuted for being a meddler, Don't pretend that it's because you're a Christian. Maybe it's because you're a gossiper and people think badly of you. Maybe it's because you love drama and insert yourself into other people's business too much that people give you a bad name. If that's the case, then you deserve that bad name and you should rectify it and you should repent. But if you simply are suffering the vitriol and the abuse, even just the insult, the snide comment, simply for being a Christian, well, don't be ashamed, but give praise to God that you bear the name of Christian, one who belongs to the Christ, the suffering servant, the risen saviour, the returning judge. 
There's no reason to then hide your faith or shrink back from being known as a Christian. The goal is to persevere and give glory to God. Friends, don't you feel the challenge there that when suffering for being a Christian comes, when people speak ill of you unjustly or um, disassociate with you or they leave you out or you're disadvantaged at work, in business, at school, when your friendship group says mean things about you or leaves you off the group chat or stops inviting you to things because you're a Christian and they make, it makes them feel uncomfortable. Notice that there's nothing in there about retribution. There's nothing in there about clearing your name and seeking justice. There's nothing in there about alleviating the suffering. The goal is not to fix people's view of you. The goal is to cling to Jesus and to praise God that you're connected to Him forever, that you're part of His family. There's no greater privilege in the world. It was interesting this week on the radio, I heard this segment about Um, the historicity of Christmas, because it's Christmas time. And so the radio presenter on the ABC was like, let's think about the historicity of this whole business. Let's look to a biblical historian and talk about the accounts of Matthew and Luke. Why are they different? Why are they the same? What are the kind of common elements? Did some text criticism on the radio. It was all very interesting. No call for everyone to repent and trust Jesus. Nothing about kind of evangelizing people except to say the gospel accounts are really fascinating and historical. And Richard Glover, the radio presenter who himself is an atheist who doesn't believe in Jesus but finds the whole thing interesting, was just gobsmacked that Twitter and the text line and the internet exploded with vitriol with anger, with outrage that you'd mention the Bible on the radio. That these stupid Christians keep inserting themselves into our Christmas. And it's easy to feel defensive, right? To feel like you need to insert yourself in there to to win the argument, to bring back respect (laughs) to, to, to the church or to the Bible or something. Peter says none of that. He just says, praise God that you belong to Jesus. Commit yourself to a faithful creator and continue to do good. And he takes us instead to a place that doesn't seek to justify ourselves or alleviate our suffering or to fix our reputation, but to a place that is to to think about the eternal destination of those who would respond to Jesus in such a way. To bring about compassion and prayerfulness for the lost. Because if you think it's difficult to walk the Christian life, to experience the fiery trial of persecution, it's nothing, Peter says, compared to the fiery trial of hell. And so instead of seeking to alleviate your Christian suffering in this life, maybe prayerfully seek to alleviate the eternal suffering of others in the life to come. He says it there in verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Judgment begins now for the Christian. The fiery trial that you walk through, the difficulty of the Christian life being persecuted and maligned and spoken ill of because you're a Christian, here's the hot tip. That's as bad as God's judgment will be for you. God's judgment on you doesn't get worse than that. It is simply His discipline for His children to to fix your heart and your mind, your faith and hope on the Lord Jesus. 
And so consider then the outcome for those who don't obey the gospel of God. And verse 18, if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the godly and the sinner? Think about the eternal destination of those who reject the gospel, that you might respond with prayer and compassion instead of self-defense and self-justification. There's a time to defend the gospel. There's a time to stand up for the truth. There's a time to debate the issues. But defensive debates very rarely do anything for the cause of the gospel. Has anyone ever been saved for eternity through a debate on Twitter? Maybe, I doubt it. However, stacks of people have been saved for eternity by Christians not being concerned for their own reputation, for their own accolades, for their own achievement, for their own reputation, but self-sacrificially care and patiently do good and respond with humility and compassion to graciously love those around them, even those who disagree with them even those who hate them. And so continue to do good even as you walk the path of suffering, knowing that it helps you to realise that your identity, your security and your future are connected to Jesus forever. And that therefore you can rejoice and you can praise God even as you entrust yourself to a faithful creator and continue to do good. Fanny Crosby was a hymn writer um, 150 years ago, right when this church was being built. And for some reason, her hymns and her life has kind of been rattling around my brain for the last couple of weeks. Struck by how many times in the hymns of Fanny Crosby she uses the image of seeing Jesus clearly and seeing him face to face, which was a prominent hope for hers as she spent her whole life blind. But walking through her circumstances didn't cause her to to solely look to the future hope that she had in Jesus, but the future hope in Jesus was a living hope that shaped the way she continued to do good here and now. Advocating for justice, caring for the poor. Even when she was rich and famous by the world's standards, she stayed living in a poor neighbourhood that she could witness to the reality of her saviour to the poor. And I'm going to finish tonight with this hymn from Fanny Crosby, that helps us to fixate not on our circumstances, but on our Saviour. She writes, Take the world, but give me Jesus. All the world's joys are but a name, but His love abides forever, through eternal years the same. Take the world, but give me Jesus, sweetest comfort of my soul. With my Saviour watching over me, I can sing, though the billows roll. Oh, the height and depth of mercy. Oh, the length and breadth of love. Oh, the fullness of redemption, the pledge of endless life above. Take this world, as my God is enough. Take the world, but give me Jesus. In his cross my trust shall be. Till with clearer, brighter vision, face to face, my Lord, I see. Take this world and give me Jesus. In his cross, my trust shall be. Take this world and give me Jesus. Till on that day, my Lord, I see.